In this video, I'm going to digress a little bit and talk about the physics of semiconducting diode lasers. Invented in 1960 with the first prototype built by Theodore Maiman, lasers are everywhere now. But you know, a lot of people don't even know what it stands for. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, and even fewer people know what it means. We've talked a little bit about stimulated emission in a previous video. I'm going to build from that definitional description of the process. Commonly, lasers can come as either gas lasers or diode lasers. I mean, there are other types. There are solid-state lasers, which are distinct from diode lasers. We'll focus today on diode lasers. In a gas laser, the emission of radiation comes from atoms. And in a diode laser, the emission of radiation comes from electrons going from the conduction band back down to the valence band and emitting a photon. The basic math I'm about to show you can be applied to either situation, where you have an excited state and a ground state. That excited state could be the excited state of an atom, or it could be the conduction band of a semiconductor. And the ground state could be the valence band of a semiconductor. And so we'll have these two different energies, E1 and E2, which in the case of a diode will be the valence band level and the, the conduction band edge level. The reason for the capital N, N1 and N2, is it's the number of systems in each state. So you get a laser because you have an ensemble of radiators, an ensemble of atoms, something on the order of Avogadro's number of atoms, all of which can be excited and then emit, or a large number of electrons in the conduction band. Each electron you'll consider to be a system, and an ensemble means just the collection of all of them. So N1 is the number of electrons that are in the valence band that could go into the conduction band, and N2 is the number of electrons in the conduction band that, that could go into the valence band. Because electrons are fermions, we'll use Fermi-Dirac statistics. So let's talk about what this ratio, N2 divided by N1 plus N2, means physically. N2 is the number of electrons that are up there in the conduction band. N1 plus N2 then would be the total number of players in the game, the total number of valence and, and conduction electrons that are available for transitioning. The number depends on temperature and is described by the Fermi-Dirac distribution. N2 will set it equal to e to the minus e2 minus e Fermi, and N1 will be e to the minus e1 minus e Fermi. Now that's the Boltzmann approximation. This exponential is actually an approximation of 1 divided by e to the plus e2 minus e Fermi plus 1. Go back and take a look at equation 1.7.2 to remind yourself about what the Boltzmann approximation is. It says that this exponential dominates over the 1 that is added to. This is simplified further easily by just uh, dividing out this numerator, in which case you end up with uh, the expression shown here. This difference, E2 minus E1, we call it delta E. It's essentially the gap energy, but you know, as we talked about in previous videos, the gap energy plus KT, but we'll just use the gap energy. And that's the fraction of electrons that are sitting up there in the, the excited state, which will be the conduction band of the semiconductor. This is temperature dependent. If we go to zero temperature, you're not going to have any electrons up there in the conduction band. In fact, let's take a little look at that. Let's just play with this expression a little bit. Let's ask a simple question. What percentage of systems, that is in this case a uh, diode electrons, are in the upper state at room temperature? Suppose the gap energy is 2 eV. So then you use 2 eV for that E2 minus E1, and you calculate 4 times 10 minus 34 is that ratio, which I will interpret as 4 times 10 minus 32 percent. Uh, so none, right? So at room temperature, with the 2 eV band gap, you simply don't have electrons in the conduction band. Well, that's not exciting. But what if you made the temperature really high? Because in order to have photons emitted, you have to get some electrons up there. So one way to do it is just to, to heat up the semiconductor. So let, let's make it infinitely hot, way higher than the melting point even. Just, just pretend for a second. If you had the temperature go to infinity, that ratio goes to one half. That's an interesting thing to note. No matter how hot you make this semiconductor, you cannot get more than half of the electrons up into the conduction band. That's called the classic two-state problem. It's an important problem in, in both in statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics. 
if you have two energy states available, you can never see more than half of the systems excited if you do it through temperature, that is thermally excited. So thermal agitation cannot get you more than half of the systems in the excited state. That's an issue for us because as long as you can't get more than half of the electrons up in the conduction band, then you're not going to have any luck with stimulated emission because you have way too much resonant absorption going on. We need to find a way to get this ratio greater than 50% so that every time a photon comes along, simulated emission happens more frequently than resonant absorption. For the electrons that are in their valence band, that's what happens. They'll absorb that photon and go into the conduction band. The electrons that are in the conduction band will be tickled by that photon and send out two photons. We need to have more than half of the electrons upstairs in the conduction band. So we need a non-thermal input because temperature isn't going to do it for us. At room temperature, there are none. We have different ways of getting electrons up into the conduction band. You can imagine doing it by uh, showering a bunch of photons onto the semiconductor. And actually, in a practical diode laser, the non-thermal input will be current, current injection. Make a note of that. We'll, we'll come back to that uh, shortly. But just imagine for a moment here that I have my semiconductor and I, I shower a bunch of photons whose energy just happens to be the band gap. What happens to those photons that enter the semiconductor? Some of them will be absorbed and some of them won't be absorbed. Instead, will stimulate emission of another photon. The question is, how many of them get absorbed? How many of them don't get absorbed, but in fact duplicate, which is what stimulated emission does? Let's reason that. The absorption happens when one of those photons encounters an electron in the valence band that's available for elevation to the conduction band. Stimulated emission happens when one of those photons encounters an electron in the conduction band. The rate of those two processes, absorption and stimulated emission, should be proportional to those populations. The number of electrons in the valence band will be proportional to the absorption rate, and the number of electrons up in the conduction band will be proportional to the stimulated emission rate. A yet a further illustration of why we need to get more electrons up in the conduction band available for, for drop into the valence band than we already have in the valence band available for promotion to the conduction band. In other words, N2 has got to be greater than N1, or all you're doing is absorbing that light. If N1 is larger, that's what dominates. But if N2 is larger, stimulated emission will dominate. And that's important, because when you have stimulated emission, you, first of all, don't lose the photon. And secondly, you make a new photon. So you have an amplification. And that's the amplification in light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. You take one photon, you get two photons. And then we do other tricks to hang on to those photons, bounce them back and forth, and make even more to get a cascade. That's essential. Stimulated emission is how you turn one photon into two, and so that's what we want to make happen. Absorption, as you can imagine, is useless if what you want to do is produce a bright light. Here's another just illustration. Here I have a bunch of electrons up in the conduction band. So I've definitely gotten more electrons upstairs than I, I have available downstairs to go up. Along comes a photon. It causes an electron to drop down to the valence band and emit another photon and to come out. Here, let's do it, ag let's do it again. All right. You get the two coming out, and they're in phase. They're going the same direction. Uh, another photon comes along. It'll do it again, and, and the two will make a, a duplicate of itself, and you'll have four photons. Only two went in, four came out. But there are electrons in the valence band, so every once in a while a photon will come along and it will simply be absorbed and up goes that electron. So that's resonant absorption. We need more stimulated emission than we get resonant absorption. That has to happen. So that's why we have more electrons upstairs to have a laser, so that we have more cases of stimulated emission than we have of resonant absorption. When that happens, it's called population inversion. When you make it happen, that N2 is greater than N1. We already argued you can't do that with temperature. We need to have other ways to get a bunch of electrons up into the conduction band. In the case of a gas laser, we do it by having atomic collisions, like a helium-neon gas laser. You have a bunch of helium. You have more helium than you have neon. 
we can get helium atoms excited into a metastable state by bombarding them with electrons and then those metastable heliums collide with neons uh, and and excite the, the neons to a very very similar energy level it just happens to uh, to be in a neon atom uh, it, a neon atom has a very useful energy level that's at the same level of the excited state of helium that's how it's done with atoms with semiconductors we get a bunch of electrons up to, to the conduction band through current injection, which you can think of as driving the quasi-Fermi levels all the way up to the conduction band or valen the valence band edges. So driving those quasi-Fermi levels right to the, to the band edges. That then turns the behavior of the electrons into metallic. It causes it to become metallic in, in behavior. You know, electrons can occupy energy levels all the way up to the Fermi level. So by getting the quasi-Fermi level to go into the conduction band edge, you fill it up with electrons. So I'll show you, I'll show you an image of that uh, in a minute here. So if you can make this happen, if you can get population inversion, then you can send in photons which are probably just generated by other electrons dropping down, but you can send in photons and get double number out. That's not very impressive amplification, by the way. That's a gain of two, right? So that's probably not a very bright light. In order to actually have a useful laser put reflecting surfaces on the semiconducting die to reflect those photons back into the semiconductor and make more photons. And so then you get a lot of photons. And that's the cascade that we really need to have, have happen. That's uh, something we're going to talk about in a later lecture, how we, how we do that. Let's look at a physical realization of the die for a diode laser. That is the, the, the semiconductor physical structure. We'll look at a PN junction, but let me walk you through this description up here. So this is a forward-biased gallium arsenide degenerate homojunction. Let's talk about each one of these words. First, forward-biased means a higher voltage, higher potential level on the P side, which means that current flows easily through through the junction. Because gallium arsenide is a direct band gap semiconductor, it works well for this. Degenerate means that the P and the N sides are so heavily doped that the quasi-Fermi levels have been pushed into the conduction band edge on the N side and the valence band edge on the P side. And homojunction means that it's the same type of material on both sides. It's gallium arsenide on both sides. The only thing that's different is the doping type on both sides. And the reason why I point that out is because commercially realized diode lasers are probably pretty entirely uh, heterojunction. So I'll give you an illustration at the end here of that. So let's look at a band diagram of this degenerate homojunction. Degenerate meaning that the quasi-Fermi levels, so here you have E sub F, N, the quasi-Fermi level in the N-type material, and the quasi-Fermi level in the P-type material have been pushed beyond the band edge. They, they should be in the band gap, but they're beyond the band edge. And a consequence of that is that carriers can occupy. Electrons can, can be anywhere up to that Fermi level. That's the Fermi C. And holes can be anywhere above the quasi-Fermi level for holes. So what does that do for us? That means then that you have a lot of electrons in the conduction band and you have a lot of holes in the valence band. That alone doesn't produce a lot of light unless those electrons and holes are in the same place. Well, there's the depletion region. There's actually the diffusion length. Let's start with that first. These ends depict the end of the diffusion region. And so it, it fills up with the electrons and with, with holes. Within the depletion region, which is smaller than the diffusion region, you can actually generate photons and keep them. Now, photons will generate any place where the electrons and the holes are in the same place. So, so throughout this whole region here, this overlap, you can make electrons and, and holes. Actually, uh, I should call that the diffusion region. Specifically within the depletion region, which is a little bit narrower, you can hang on to the light. And the reason why is in the depletion region, you have a reduction in the charge carrier density. In equilibrium, there are no charge carriers in the depletion region, just ions. If we bias this thing, we have current, so there are, but there are fewer. And when you have fewer charge carriers, you have a higher index of refraction. That means the index of refraction in the depletion region is higher than the index of refraction everywhere else in the semiconductor. 
What that does is that turns the depletion region, which follows along the junction, that turns the depletion region into a fiber optic. It has a slightly higher index of refraction. It will guide the light. The photons preferentially go all in the same direction. Because you may have been wondering, well, how do you get the photons to all go in the same direction in order to have a laser? You do it by that technique. So the junction gets turned into a fiber optic because the depletion region has a slightly higher index of refraction. That's why I depicted this photon apparently going that way. And I'll do that down here too. So every time you know, an electron and a hole com recombine, they emit a photon and it is directed along the junction. The luminous region is really the depletion region. Whichever side is more lightly doped has a larger depletion region. And usually we try to make sure that the P side is more lightly doped so that it has the longer depletion length X of P because electrons have larger diffusion lengths. That's the band diagram. A physical realization may be even better than this, uh, just to really see what a dye might look like. Imagine the gallium arsenide block where the top is P-doped and the bottom is N-doped, and you put a biasing pad, a little, little voltage pad on there, and you, you raise it up and you have it grounded on the, the bottom side so that current passes through the junction from the plus V to the ground, and light comes out like a ribbon you know, emerging from the depletion region right around the junction. A more efficient laser is accomplished with a double hetero junction, which we've already talked about, uh, where, where you have a region, say, of gallium arsenide sandwiched between two tunable uh, band gap uh, semiconductors of aluminum gallium arsenide. Then you create a quantum well. And so this quantum well is able to store up charged carriers uh, longer than the recombination time to ensure that they all make a photon. And so you have a, a more efficient laser by using that. And so the double heterojunction laser is more, more effect, even more efficient. And out comes the ribbon of laser light. Now, you don't normally see a ribbon of light coming out of a laser, but the, the shaping is accomplished with how the ends are, are polished and, and how the optics outside the die are designed. And so the, there's a lot of beam forming that goes into the design of a, a diode laser outside of the semiconductor. I'm going to stop it with that, and then we'll talk about narrowing this line width up next. This is going to be a pretty broad line because we've talked about how wide the spectral distribution is for light that's generated this way. So that's our next topic.